Hello, and welcome to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Kraus, licensed professional counselor. In today's episode, I'm going to be interviewing J.W. Freiberg. We are going to be discussing loneliness, the epidemic of chronic loneliness in the United States and other places around the world in modern society, and how that affects our mental health and our physical health. We are going to talk about J.W. Freiberg's experience as a social psychologist and lawyer and why he decided to write several excellent books on the topic. Let me tell you a little bit about our guest. J.W. Freiberg studies chronic loneliness through the unique lens of a social psychologist as he had his PhD from UCLA and he also has a JD from Harvard Law School. A former assistant professor in the Department of Social Psychology at Boston University, he served for decades as general counsel to more than a dozen mental health and social service agencies in Boston, including the Home for Little Wanderers, the nation's oldest child welfare organization. In his newly released book, Surrounded by Others and Yet So Alone, A Lawyer's Case Stories of Love, Loneliness, and Litigation, Dr. Freiberg explores the impact of faulty connections and failing relationships through the telling of case stories mined from his 30 years as an attorney. His award-winning book, Four Seasons of Loneliness, explored the chronic loneliness that comes to isolated and disconnected individuals. The papers presented at his 2018 Symposium on Child Loneliness are collected into his edited work, Growing Up Lonely. Dr. Freiberg is a member of the Massachusetts State Bar and the Bar of the Supreme Court of the United States of America. For more information about his books, we will have the links in the show notes, but www.lonelinessbooks.com is where you'll find him. He's also known as Terry to those who know him personally, and I am so happy to have him on the show. Here's the interview. All right, it is my honor to bring to the show Dr. J.W. Freiberg. Welcome to the show, The Intentional Clinician. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. So, and everyone calls you Terry in your life, so I'm just going to refer to you as Terry for the rest of the show. Please do. And you've been, I mean, as I read in your bio, you've been in the field of social psychology and also law for many, many years. And you have a new book out May 1st, 2020, Surrounded by Others and Yet So Alone. And I've been reading that book and I really like it a lot. It reads, it's sort of like a memoir filled with really interesting facts and stories because you're talking about yourself, but you're talking about the cases and how you handle them, almost like a detective. It reminded me of a detective book, even though it's a lawyer story, but then it also sparkles in these um, very readable and teachable moments about social psychology, the nature of relationships. And I, you didn't tell me this, but I saw some, some references to the neurobiology research, um, in here about how the brain works a little bit and why that was so important to some of your cases when you presented it to uh, the judge in question. So yeah, I'm very excited about this book. Can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write this book? Sure. Uh, It was because I didn't, I didn't cover that half of loneliness in my previous book which was called Four Seasons of Loneliness from 2016. And that book presented four case stories of people whose loneliness came from their isolation. They were really disconnected individuals. So no great surprise to any of us, I think, that if you are super isolated and lack connections, you may end up in the camp of the chronically lonely. What I didn't cover and what I cover in this book is that the other half of chronically lonely people are married, they have children, they have uh, teammates, they have workmates, uh, they have relationships in their lives, but they still become chronically lonely. How is that? How can you be surrounded by others and yet so alone? So this book is a response to my having messed up the first book by taking only cases of isolated people. Here we have cases of people who are very connected with others, and yet those relationships bring them no nurturing, bring them no warmth, bring them no soothing. 
Yes, and I think that a lot of people listening either have can resonate with that or possibly have known people that have been in those situations where they're they're around a lot of people in a milieu, but yet they feel alone. And to get to dive into it even further, I think I want to let the audience know something that struck me right off the bat when I was reading your book is your definition of loneliness. And I thought it would be good to kind of start the conversation with a little bit of the your definition of loneliness and some of the facts about why loneliness and chronic loneliness is so dangerous to our health. So I was blown away, but I want to let you explain it because it it definitely is a, a new paradigm in my mind about how I think of it. Uh, sure. Um, I pretty sure that what loneliness is, is is a basic sensation like hunger or thirst or fear. It doesn't initiate in our forebrain, in our language enabled forebrain. It's it comes from us because we're animals, we're mammals. And we receive from our parietal lobe, if you like, a signal of loneliness, just like we receive signals of hunger or thirst or fear. So it's our animal selves that becomes hungry at first. Only then do we think, oh my goodness, I'm hungry. What should I have tonight? I've got a choice between A and B. Or, oh, I'm thirsty. I better not have another soda. I'm supposed to limit those, and I've already had one today. Same with fear. Same with loneliness. We get this feeling of loneliness when we're disconnected, too disconnected from others. And then we think with our forebrain about what to do about it. I, maybe I'll call my mom. Maybe I'll call my friend. Maybe I'll go to the corner pub and see about having a beer with my with my mates, as they say in, in England. Um, so it's a very different view of, of how loneliness initiate, is initiated in us by our animal selves. And when we compare humans with some of the great apes, with elephants and the cetacean mammals, so that would be the whales, the dolphins, and the porpoises, we have a very similar social pattern. We, we're family-based, small pod herd mammals. And it literally hurts us when we're too distanced and, and, and disconnected with others. And I always ask people uh, when I speak in groups, um, and if you think I'm exaggerating that it hurts to be lonely, just like it hurts to physically hurt yourself, tell me this, which hurts more? A broken arm or a broken heart? That is profound. And yes, uh, absolutely. I've, I've heard something like that before because somebody told me uh, that they felt that physical abuse was easier to overcome in their life than emotional abuse and uh, relationship severs because the, the physical abuse was, was time limited and over and you could recover and your body naturally would heal, or if you had to go to the doctor and get something fixed up, um, that could heal and you could kind of feel the progress. Whereas emotional abuse or disconnection or a breakup, it doesn't, unless, especially, especially if you're not in a healthy situation, may feel unresolved and therefore as if it can't heal and it's just sort of sitting there. And sitting in in our in our psyche and in our in our emotional life, which is uh, burdening us even further. Yes, so. and, and 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 sitting in a special place. Um, I'm, for many years, I've been on the board of the Trauma Research Foundation, and I work closely with uh, trauma psychiatrists. And one of the things over the last three or four decades that trauma psychiatrists have worked on is how to deal with trauma victims because their traumatic memories say they were at war and their buddies were blown up and killed around them and they saw and did horrible things on the battlefield. And then they come home and they're diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, for example. Where are those memories located? Well, it's not in the forebrain. It's not like if I asked you to memorize the list of presidents of the United States. Those memories are... I'm stopping for a moment because the grass cutting's going on. There, you moved by the window. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> the um, traumatic memories are stored somatically. They're stored in the body. And so when, when a, a soldier with post-traumatic stress disorder hears a car backfire, 
he absolutely jumps out of his shoes the way a deer or a squirrel jump when you shock them by slamming the door and coming upon them accidentally. It's, it's in their very body that they store these memories. And hence, trauma therapy has tried to, um, take, to take note of that and to come up with therapeutic techniques that recognize that. It's the same with loneliness. When people are chronically lonely, it's not a thought in their forebrain, or it's also a thought in their forebrain, no problem. But it's also a body, a feeling that's stored deep in their body of, of, of the fear and the discomfort of disconnection. It's fun, for example, to remember that in medieval Europe, the greatest punishment that was available in most places to to levy on he who committed the serious crime was banishment. Being put outside of the village, the community, left you a non-viable individual, cut off from all the safety and security and nurturing that we all receive from our close connections. I very much appreciate that. Um, I'm going to ask you some more about that, but as I started a place in Grand Rapids called the Trauma Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids. And it was inspired by a lot of the trauma psychiatrists work like Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, uh, because I believe that trauma informed therapy and understanding that in the medical world, but also in the, in the society is so important. And that translates perfectly into the loneliness discussion because it's going under the, the same science-based paradigm, understanding ourselves as, as beings and humans not just our narrative story that we tell, but that we have basic biological needs that underpin these things. Like you said, a person will feel lonely, just like thirst. They'll feel that thirst. But yet, you know, like I was thinking about this, and that's why I'm going to ask you about these misconnections, um, this misconnection concept and disconnection concept, because people misconstrue. Sometimes they'll make up a story about not being lonely. They'll try to justify it or they'll buy, they'll get pets or they'll go get their haircut uh, way more often than they need or uh, go to the local bar just to be, just to sit around people like coffee shops. Um, why do people go study material in noisy coffee shops? Because I don't know, my, I like to be around people. It helps me study, I think. Um, so, Getting back to your one of the first things you said, which was that, you know, this you in the first book, you talked about just this explicit idea of people that are very much lonely, cut off, isolated and uh, all of that and the health effects of that and the stories of that. In this book, you you're covering more of this misconnection and you talked about these five modes, tenuous connections, one way fraudulent, obstructed, and dangerous connections. And I think I, we don't need to go into all of it. And I just kind of want to get your take about why these type of relationships can damage people just as much, possibly as much as the other type of loneliness, if that's what you're saying. Well, what, what we do know from studies of, of loneliness, particularly based on the UCLA loneliness scale, version three, which is a very valid and reliable scale for measuring loneliness, is that about half of lonely people are from disconnected circumstances, and about the other half are from misconnected circumstances. So you're just as likely to become chronically lonely if you're bad at the game of making relationships as you are if you live all alone in an isolated place. Um, now, the five modes of misconnection, as I call them, were not theoretically derived. Oh, okay. No, they're not at all. All they are, and I don't mean to make more of them than what they are, is that I took my about 1,250 law files that had anything to do with loneliness, and, and that's how they, the cases fell out. Let me just back up one step and say what I did as a lawyer. I was always in a law firm, but because I had the social psychology background, I quickly became general counsel to Boston's principal social service agencies, both adult and especially ch a lot of children's ones, as well as uh, dozens of adoption agencies and scores of practices of psychiatrists, psychologists, and clinical social worker. 
And I was the lawyer they called when they needed a legal consult. For example, let's say they had a clinical session, session in which a child described what the clinician took to be uh, domestic abuse. So they have a legal requirement in Massachusetts to, make, to file uh, anything that has to do with domestic abuse or child abuse or child neglect. But they never know when, whether the threshold has been, has been crossed, whether what they've heard is adequate cause to prevent them being somehow counterattacked by a client with whom they otherwise have a privileged conversation. So I was the lawyer they called to say, this is what I heard. What should I do? Should I call social services? Should I call the police? Or can I involve the, the, uh, the, the, parental, the uh, paternal grandfather who seems a great guy, even though the, the father himself is legally barred from visiting the child? All those kind of legal questions. So I would get the background of each case, obviously, before I would render the legal advice. And because I was a social scientist at the same time as a lawyer, I couldn't help but see this as a sort of um, de facto social, re social science research and, and done under some interesting circumstances because lawyers can compel the testimony of people. And, and whereas uh, clinicians are, are sitting there hoping they'll be told the truth and in a, in, in a meaningful way so they can understand and make use of it in, in therapy. So, I have about 1,250 files that came from 30 years of doing that work. And when I looked at them for those that had something to do with loneliness, and that's a different conversation about why I got interested in that subtopic, I, I, I made piles of, of, of the files, if you like, and they fell out. The cases that had to do with misconnection type loneliness fell out in five piles. And those are the five you read obstructed connections had to do with people who were basically too busy to relate meaningfully and fully with others in their lives. There's a story of a little boy who's, as he put it, he, he's, he was my, the youngest client I ever had. He was eight, I think. And uh, it turned out he needed legal help or so he, he, he told his physician at Boston Children's Hospital, who was a cancer patient, that I need to talk to a lawyer. And when my friend asked me to go in and talk to this little fella, he told me that he wanted some help because his parents did love the way a flashlight shines light when its batteries are almost worn out. It's just a glow. It doesn't help you see in the dark. So that's what happens when people's lives are just too full of busyness to take the time to love their little child. Another way was one-way connections, when people get involved in relationships for different purposes. I, I once had a client who fell deeply in love with an Englishman and uh, left her life, uh, everything about her life, including her family and her graduate school work, to marry him. And it turned out he was completely a fake. He wasn't an Englishman. He was an American with a fake accent. And his mysterious international dealings were drug dealing. So here they were involved in a relationship. She was looking for love and he was looking for cover, a way of hiding himself from the authorities. And I'll just pick one more, dangerous connections. The story you'll be reading at the end of the book is about domestic abuse, a terrible case of domestic abuse. My neighborhood had no good baking going on and this magnificent French bakery opened in a little shop and for six months was the delight of the neighborhood. It was like living in France, beautiful baguettes, beautiful croissant. It was wonderful. And then it stopped and the bread was awful for a while. And I just thought, well, you know, shops going under. Then it popped back and was perfect again. So after about three of these pop of these revolutions from wonderful to, to really poor baking, it dawned on me that the chief baker was domestically abused. And when she was hurting, her bread was salty and it was crustless and flavorless. So that was a real lesson to me that uh, domestic abuse is, is a relationship. It's, it's hard for people to walk out on even though they're battered because it's still a connection. It's just a dangerous connection. So that's three of the five ways in which the cases fell out and demonstrated 
what I called, for want of a better term, misconnection, in order to contrast it with disconnection, an easy concept that we all fully understand, I think. And I think also for the people that are involved, uh, the disconnection crowd, it's pretty obvious, I think, not always, but for, for being a clinician, that the insight that you're alone, you don't leave your apartment, you hardly are engaged in anything social, you're not engaged in an online community would be easier to fetter out and explain where as somebody in one of these, like the tenuous connection, which I want to talk about that one in a minute, um, they may not, there's so many complicated factors that are contributing to their loneliness and other chronic difficult feelings uh, in their life that um, they may not even realize that they're lonely um, it, for a while until they get the right insight. Um, as a clinician, I was just thinking about that where it's more obvious if you're just disconnected. But one of the th- stories um, uh, really took me was the, the girl who inherited France, uh, the little, the, one of the, the first ones about the tenuous connections. And I was, I was thinking about that story um, because I don't know, it just, the way you got involved and how involved you were was amazing to me. Uh, and I, I mean, I think, yeah, I, I have so much to say about it, but I want to hear a little bit about um, your take on that story, which we would refer to as a tenuous connection. Right. Well, the, the whole point of connections that we have with our families and make with our friends is the, is the continuity. That's where the safety comes from, and that's where the continued nurturing can take place right through life. You might imagine when a new book comes out, I send a copy to each of my two sisters right away. That's what connections are all about, is continuity through through life. And we, we actually, when we study friendships, um, it's amazing how long the average friendship uh, can last. Uh, people have friendships that that uh, from their childhood, if they're fortunate, and they treasure them as adults. Um, and so in a tenuous relationship, the opposite is the case, that the, the relationship is at risk. You can't count on it being there. And the case I use to illustrate that point is the case of a little girl whose father was not her biological father. He be- began living with uh, the little girl's mother when she was pregnant by a previous relationship. And so the little girl was raised until age six, um, I think it was, by um, her biological mother and her her stepfather. But when her biological mother, at age 33, if I remember correctly, had a stroke and passed away completely unexpectedly, there was no legal relationship left. Uh, and so the um, stepfather, uh, not a legal stepfather, but just the person who had fathered this child and adored her, Um, came to me as an attorney uh, and said, can you help me? I've got to keep this child in my life. I've raised her to age six. I love her to pieces. I'm terminally um, unable to father a a child biologically as chance would have. This is my child or I have no child. And so we went off on a hunt to see who could, who could um, stand in against the biological grandmother who the child had really never known Um, And that would only be the biological father. So off I went to France to locate the biological father and see if I couldn't talk him into joining our campaign and our probate and family court litigation to try to talk a Massachusetts judge into allowing custody to remain in the hands of this man who had acted as the child's father but had no legal relationship to the father. That's the background of the story. Yes. Um, well, a couple things. I kind of want to go on the... Per- I have some scientific I thing I want to draw in here, but I kind of want to talk about... Personally, I, I, uh, I feel like as a lawyer and also a social scientist, this, this combination that you, that you've, you are, uh, your attention to detail was extravagantly clear and interesting to me reading how you thought about the case from all these different angles and how different conversations with people or things you read or thoughts would pop into your mind and make you think about it from a different angle. And also just being very creative because you, I don't want to spoil the story, but let's just, it's a great book. So let's just, I'll do a little bit of it, but you had to convince 
someone in France who did not know they had a biological daughter because the woman had never uh, told him after their affair that she, or Trist, I'm sorry, it was a Trist. It wasn't an affair because he wasn't married yet and all that, uh, that she was pregnant. And then she fell in love with this other doctor in the U.S., similar doctor, osteopath. She had a type, I'm assuming. So, uh, she, you know, they, you had to convince this person in France who didn't know he had a daughter who was now married and had a life of his own and children, a child of his own to co-parent across the Atlantic ocean with another doctor in Boston and somehow also, uh, make it fair for the grandmother in Texas. Of course, that was up to the judge uh, who had seen the baby once when she was born or something. And then also the the nuances of Massachusetts state law and the rules about child welfare, what's in the best interest of the child. And it, it's, uh, it sounds technical on the podcast, but I'm telling you, this is, it, it read like a movie. I mean, I, I've already read most of this book and it, I read it like in a day or two. So, I mean, it's fantastic. I actually wonder if you're going to make it into an audio book. Um, but that is so complicated. I don't know. When you think of a lawyer, you think like rules and statutes and all this, but you're having to creatively come up with this, basically brokering a connection to protect this girl. Because if this just went to a standard, regular court proceeding, it would have gone to the nearest biological relative and probably in the United States. So it probably would have gone to the grandmother who she didn't know, who lived in a uh, very, very small town in rural Texas, which this girl was bilingual, spoke French and English, had just lost her mother who died suddenly, which is a gigantic trauma uh, and affects the entire narrative of somebody, their nervous system and their personality and it can lead to, from we know from the ACEs study, can lead to chronic depression and all these other terrible health outcomes. There's a factor of loneliness. And then her father, who she knows, isn't has no legal custody. So can you share a little bit about uh, some of your, I don't know, highlights or something about how you you really dove in? I mean, you flew to France. I mean, this isn't this isn't a typical like, you know, I have friends who are lawyers. They do like phone conferences. You, you flew to France, you speak French, you went to cafes, you brokered a deal. Can you talk to us about that? I, I love this part of the story. Well, that's a bit by chance in my background. I, I happen to be French speaking and lived in France for years and so on. Um, but um, it, that was the, clearly the only thing we, the only hope we had in the case legal, from a legal precedent point of view was to have a biological relative on our side of the case. And the only one was the father. Um, and so I learned what I could about him. It wasn't coincidence they were both orthopedic surgeons. The mother was an orthopedic nurse, and that's how she met both of them. And so um, I advised my client that um, you could not call someone over a phone and say, I don't know how to tell you this, but you impregnated a woman six years ago. She had a child, uh, and now that child's uh, stepfather needs your help. That's not going to work. (laughs) <laughs> you need to be there and think through the conversation. So I went, I, I went, and I went a few days early. And and um, I have uh, French friends who date back uh, forty or fifty years, uh, when we were all as young as could be, and and now we have grandchildren. That's how long these friendships are. And I went out to dinner with a, a well known French family sociologist uh, and her husband. And um, and as luck would have it. Um, the norm in France is is a bit different than ours. Uh, the, the norm in France would be to respond to paternity. To do nothing would be would would break their norm. Uh, so I had that on my side, and then um, and then I also had the generosity of the stepfather, who was very willing to assign half of his estate some someday when he passes away to the half sister of this child because the French family would by French inheritance law, you can't cut out children or treat them unequally. Whatever you leave, once you pass away, goes equally to your children. You can't change that as a matter of law. So all these little details had to be ironed out. 
but everybody was of good faith. And, and after all, um, a wonderful, healthy six-year-old child, bright as a light bulb, uh, is not a liability. It's an asset. And, and everybody saw her that way. And the irony is that the child now, uh, a married adult with a child of her own, is in uh, a, a, a university position in Grenoble and uh, did me the great service of translating a story of mine uh, from English into French uh, a few years ago. And uh, so it's a wonderful story because I was able, I got lucky, I was able to be helpful. Uh, things worked out fine. And, um, and if anybody needs a translator of great skill, let me know because this young lady can really go back and forth in the two languages. I love it. Yes. Um, I guess we won't totally spoil, but we kind of will. I mean, this, this story is very, uh, it's a cliffhanger. Like I had to read the whole one at once. I couldn't stop because one of the interesting things is not only did you have to use all the social psychology skills, your personal skills, your creativity, you had to make these personal connections. You got very invested. You studied her. You tried to see how she was doing as a person, which I thought was very important, um, being a lawyer to really get involved. What did she want? What did she know? And then that corresponded beautifully to the, uh, the science, which is you made an argument of basically that, you know, while the legal precedent, you know, the grandmother had rights, you know, to exert and, uh, this man in France didn't fully know his daughter yet because he had just met her. Uh, you talked about that she would have been have been felt safer and nurtured with continuing her network of connections with her school, her friends, her who she knew to be her father, um, and this new family, and also let incorporating the grandmother in on visitations, trying to make a win 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 for everyone, and also that it would have been irreparably harmful to rip her out of the life she knew in Boston and uh, to be transplanted, a bilingual child who's used to going to prep schools in Boston to a town of 450 people in rural Texas where her grandmother, and I'll tell this part of the story, the grandmother and the preacher man, uh, her husband, who was a cowboy preacher or something, uh, they seemed very focused on ideology or some sort of posturing in court until the judge reprimanded them or said, Hey, I want to know why, how are you going to take care of this girl? You know, why are you talking about your values? And this woman had the child out of wedlock, blah, blah, blah. I want to know how you're going to help her. And I felt that even though this judge, you described him as a very, very by the book gentleman, um, you were able to use, the all of the evidence that how she could be taken care of, but also bringing in the science, but also considering the grandmother's point of view into this to eventually get a a good settlement for everyone. And and now years later, you you uh, know the young lady, well, the adult lady now, uh, and it did work out for her and the family, which is wonderful and. Uh, but I thought it was interesting because you you brought in science to the courtroom about the connections and how she would be lonely and have another loss on top of her mother's, which would have been traumatic for her even further and and how that could be devastating. So I don't know if you want to comment on that one. No, oh, that's exactly right. I mean, it's one thing to um, work with um, one of the top doctors, uh, pediatricians at Ch Boston Children's Hospital, who actually set up, I believe it was the first, doesn't matter, one of the first centers in the country to uh, on child abuse and neglect uh, some 35 years ago or something, uh, very early in that field. And he's a, a magnificent expert witness. Uh, he's, he's written so many books on the topic and he's been such at, so much at the forefront of, of recognizing uh, how we need to develop techniques to deal with traumatized children that are different from adults. Uh, bringing him in as, as an expert witness was, um, is always a pleasure and he was very convincing to the courts. But also there's some amazing luck involved in any good outcome in, in court. Uh, the, uh, there was, after all, 
um, you know, uh, part of the story learned by some uh, good luck of being right place at right time and uh, trying to keep my ears and eyes open. Yeah, I was also kind of realizing that uh, lawyers have a very disrupted sleep schedule. That might be an aside for our loneliness conversation, <laughs> but there was a lot of jet lag and coffee involved. Uh, yes. According to your story, which shows your investment. Um, so uh, that's a, a lot about the story. I And I, I think a book very well read, uh, readable for anybody. So clinicians listen to the show, but a lot of um, just people from different places listen to it. And I've is very intriguing. And you've got other books too, which we could talk about. And for the kind of psychology side of things, I'd love to delve a little bit more into um, some of the science around loneliness um, and kind of, you know, I'm, I'm a therapist and a supervisor and talking about how I don't know, healthy relationships or healthy connections, either for people that are in these sort of disconnected, connect, misconnected places could help, um, could maybe help moderate or prevent forms of mental illness. Um, what are your thoughts on that? You know, if people can have healthier, authentic, safe relationships, what are, what are your thoughts? Well, they're terribly, obviously, from what uh, I've said already, I think that uh, there's probably uh, no single more important element to mental health than uh, having a, a solid and, and reliably lasting set of connections with your family to begin with when you're young and then with others as you strike out on your own to make connections. Um, so what happens when there's misconnection? What happens to people who are either not raised in, in, a, in a loving way or who are traumatized or injured in various psychological ways uh, during their youth or, or young adulthood? And so they're not skilled at making or keeping, keeping or deepening relationships. What can you do about it? Well, there is a, uh, a field of therapy that's absolutely fascinating uh, that is called relational uh, therapy. Uh, Jean Baker Miller started it, and Amy, Dr. Amy Banks, they're both psychiatrists, practices it today. And I have a paper of hers in my edited book called Growing Up Lonely, which for therapists I recommend so highly. It's so clever. There's a 20 question questionnaire, which will be on, which is going up on my website just now in a paper I wrote for the website. And by assessing your your actual relationships, people in your family, friends, work, associates, and so on, down this list of 20 questions, you can really catch a sense of how you're doing relationship by relationship. And when you look across the relationships, you can see where you're weak, what, what skills you're lacking, what it is you don't get out of relationships. Or you can look at an individual relationship and assess, whoa, that one get, brings me little. I probably should spend less time in it. And this one with someone, you know, who isn't as obviously important in my life, I keep giving the high scores to. That relationship makes me feel safe and nurtured. So there are ways, there are uh, new and exciting ways to think about each relationship and your whole set of relationships to see how you're doing. And then there are curative ideas to strengthen your capacities, your relational capacities that uh, Dr. Banks puts forth so well in that little article and in her book uh, that is referenced in the article. I like that. And so I'm going to definitely be putting your website in the show notes for everyone to be able to click on. Uh, so feel free to click on that and find the new article as well as uh, all of that that you just posted to, to do that questionnaire. And it was interesting. So we we're, we're talking about mental health and I've, I, I wanted to back when I was doing therapy on the West side of Phoenix and the West side of Chicago, two different places uh, where I lived for a while. Um, and I was working in the kind of the social service industry. Um, one of the things that we, we found anecdotally 
and I didn't know about the relational model of therapy at the time was we called it a strength-based report, a uh, strength-based theory, which was whatever therapy you're doing, always bring in strength-based theory, which is what does this child do well? What does this family do well? Emphasize that every session um, because they need to have the, a lot of the families we're working with were chronically um, in poverty. They had all sorts of difficulties, uh, health difficulties, uh, job difficulties, time, you know, they're working double, two different jobs. So we would always try to emphasize that. And then I started coming up with this, I guess, I don't remember what book I read this in, but I had gone to a psychology conference and they said, you know, you want to make your job easier, get, get a kid involved in a pro social activity. And so with all these families, I started asking, so what activities does your child involved in? And they would mostly be, well, what do you mean? What activities? They just kind of go to the park or play video games. You know, that was it. Um, in this neighborhood. And so I started working on ways to get funding for kids to get into extracurricular things and also for uh, kids who could make teams or get into choirs or whatever was involved that was free also doing that. And so uh, part of our goals of therapy would always be, can we find a pro-social activity that you like? And uh, when we when we did that, they started getting connected to coaches and started getting connected to mentors and started getting connected to other kids who were healthier and not doing antisocial behaviors, which are drug use and the gangs that were in the neighborhood. And slowly but surely, the kids who got involved, they got out of my therapy really quick. I mean, the whole point of therapy is to be done with it, you know. Uh, so I, I saw that, and it was it, it, and then it was interesting because, of course. Uh, a lot of them uh, looked healthier physically, and that's, I'm not a doctor, it was anecdotal, but we're talking about preventing, you know, mental health by having these positive connections, evaluating your relationships, where where do you feel safe, where do you feel something is difficult and grating on you, but, and then in your book here in the intro, you were talking about the University of Chicago and uh, how they'd been documenting chronically lonely people suffer significantly increased morbidity and mortality rates, and that uh, Cigna found in 2018, the U.S. Loneliness Index suggested that the problem has reached epidemic proportions, rivaling the risks posed by heavy smoking and obesity. So not just mental health. We're now talking about mental health combined, you know, mind-body. I'm all about mind-body therapy, but here's more evidence. The, someone is lonely or having a misconnection loneliness or disconnection, and then this is according to Cigna and these findings you're having in this book that you're quoting, possibly as dangerous as smoking cigarettes every day and being very overweight and, and that that could cause an early death. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, we have powerful statistics with huge ends, you know, huge studies that, that show very clearly that the morbidity is greatly increased. All sorts of systemic illnesses, heart heart ailments, for example, diabetes, um, are statistically much worse when the person is chronically lonely, when they don't have supportive connections and nurturing that we all enjoy when we're ill. It helps us heal. They don't have that. Um, and the life expectancy is significantly shorter. So you're, you're, you're far more ill if you don't have a set of connections to rely on and benefit from, and you're going to die younger. So that brings me to kind of the current state of affairs that we find ourselves in. We're recording this on uh, May 15th, 2020, and we are in the middle of quarantine, at least here where I'm at in Michigan, and I believe Massachusetts under the same uh, stay-at-home order. Um, and people are hungry for community. Uh, I know Zoom is probably making millions right now with everyone who's subscribed to it, uh, but that it, it and it feels good to be on Zoom, but it can also feel uh, you can feel draining as compared to just sitting in a room with somebody. So, can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts about how the COVID nineteen um, pandemic uh, and our safety responses to the pandemic are possibly now affecting the loneliness? Um, index and um, people's mental and physical health. Absolutely. There's no question that there's an overlap here. And, and it's fascinating to think about it. Um, 
let me give you my response in uh, in three tranches, okay, so age-wise, for elders, for working adults, and for children. Um, for elders, let's, I don't know if I've seen anything sadder than some of the newspaper images or news show images of, of uh, elderly parents locked into uh, senior centers, unable to uh, have a visit from their children even though they're so dear, greatly threatened by the disease, which has just ravished uh, senior adult care centers. Um, that's some kind of big sad photo to take a look at. I think we've all seen them in the press. So what is this thing about separated seniors off together? That's brand new. I mean, when we go back to any of our double grade or triple great grandparents, then for the whole history of humanity back behind that, Seniors weren't divided off. They were part of multi-generational families and they helped take care of grandchildren, by the way. So you had neither the care of senior ex uh, care or, nor the expense of child care because that's what they did for each other. Um, and so we've divided off our seniors in a brand new way in the last 75 years, whatever the correct number would be. But we've made them a promise to visit. We'll visit. Don't worry. I know you're here amongst strangers, all of them, many of whom are older and, and, and fr more frail than you. You don't know them. Don't worry. We'll visit often. Now we find we can't visit. So huge implications for senior citizens, obviously. When we talk about um, working adults, so people who are of working age, um, there are scores of subtopics I could bring up, but let me just mention one that I've been thinking about recently, and that is the loss of touch. Um, we're going to be going out in a world once we're, uh, the orders are lifted and we can go out with masks on, but we're clearly going to be told and advised, don't shake hands, don't pat someone on the back, don't share a cup or a drink or a, a bowl of peanuts, don't touch people. That's the way this virus propagates. What does that mean? The, wor the word touch is a very interesting word in all of the Latin-based languages, whether it's the verb to touch in English, so it means to touch physically, but it also means emotionally. That movie really touched me. It's not a physical touch. You're talking about being emotionally touched. Same word. Is that by chance? Well, in French, the verb toucher, or in Spanish, the verb tocar, is exactly the same meaning. And in German, the two words berühren and rührend, okay, the root is the same for physical touching and emotional touching. So the loss of physical touching, no shaking hands, no patting on the backs, no uh, grabbing the other guy's beer, say, can, can I have a sip of this? I'm done with mine. None of that. It's all gone. Mm. It's just one small subtopic of, of the kind of different world we're going to go out into. And thirdly, children, the world of children. Um, children have learned to make relations, to successfully connect with others through two sources. First, when they're tiny babies and small children, we hold them, we nurse them, we coddle them, we, uh, we um, soothe them, we kiss their bruised knees, we hold them up in our arms until they're six or eight or nine years old. And we still, after that, sit on the edge of the bed and read them stories and pet their head as they, as they venture off into the night. All that physical touching that we do with children comes from our mammalian selves, okay? That's the kind of animal we are. Other mammals, of course, nurse their young and, and, and brush up against them and lick their nose and, and so on, as we know. So um, children that are going to be going out into this world of no touch, stay six feet apart, keep your mask on, uh, run into the second issue. So first, parents train their children to seek connection and, and friendship and love, just like birds teach their young to fly and where, how to fish uh, and how to catch uh, food and find water and so on. We humans are all about teaching our little babies from day one, from hour one, right through their whole childhood, how to connect with others. Then comes the importance 
of inter of unstructured interchild play the playground the neighborhood streets the summer the infinite hours of summertime when you ran around playing with your friends making up crazy games that had ever changing rules and so on all of that free play that unstructured time together is where children hone their own skills about how to how to get connected with others how to be accepted by a group how to deal with rejection when you're not accepted. How to identify and deal with the town or street bully. All of those lessons are lessons your parents can't and don't teach you, and your siblings can't and don't teach you, and your teachers can't and don't teach you. they learn that from free play, from unstructured play. So what happens to these little children of ours who are staying at home more than they should, and then, what I fear is when they go out into the world at the end of this, they're going to have the same lessons we do about not touching and staying a certain distance from others. So those three age groups are all negatively affected, if in different ways, by just those are examples, of course, not full stories of how those three age groups are going to be affected by the COVID-19 isolation we're all enduring. Yes, this is quite a going to be quite a shift uh, in our culture, and I think we probably won't be able to totally figure out how it's going to affect everybody till afterwards. But I do, th- I don't think it's going to be great. We're going to have to tr- adapt in many ways. To uh, children are very adaptable, but I think you're right; they're going to need that experience. Like I was thinking about the fact that you know humans do learn by experience; they learn best by experience. You know, um, in person. And, you know, you can learn by reading and you can, you know, once, you know, and you can learn by audio book and you can learn by video classrooms, but there's something about being in person and, and putting your hands on something, your hands on experience. And I think, and I'm hoping that we come up with a solution collectively as a world to figure out how to keep people safe while allowing, especially the children to be able to interact, um, in a way that uh, they can experience that that freedom, because one of the other side effects I'm thinking about, not just with loneliness and misconnection, is fear. The uh, I think we're entering in, uh, uh, after this will be an, or maybe during right now it's already started and an, uh, another epidemic of lon- of loneliness, but also of anxiety. Um, I think then you pair those two together, and as a clinician, I can tell you that. Both of those things are terrible for mental health, being lonely and anxious, because then you're anxious to even initiate outside contact. Um, The antidote or possibility, one of the possibilities I've thought about is the online communities are growing. Um, People are starting Facebook groups and support groups online and Zoom groups, which is great if you have access to technology and you have access to that. and it can be useful, but um, obviously we're gonna. There's some other unanswered questions of adaptation that are going to be proposed, and the side effects of which we won't know for a while. But you've talked about those in your examples. Yes, exactly. I thought one of the fascinating examples uh, in the real world we've all seen um, is the empty empty supermarket shelves. I, I, I didn't even know that supermarkets had shelves. I thought that food was sort of suspended in the air. And all of a sudden, the shelves were empty one day. I mean, really empty. And I think that's fascinating to think about. So why is it? How come people... Um, are uh, panicked to the to the point where you know they buy a truckload of, uh, of the, whatever their favorite food is or something, and with with almost total disconcern for the needs of others. What happened to the social coordination and cooperation? Well, fear, as you correctly bring up, you know, it comes out of our animal selves. That it's not just our forebrain thinking about, oh, maybe the food chain supply will be affected. What with restaurants closed and everybody having to cook at home, that's that's the intellectual part that explains what happened. But it, the motivation for people to buy, and we all saw online photographs of people with five shopping carts and bizarre amounts of, for example, milk. You know, people with, uh, I remember one photo showed a, a chap, he must have had a, he had as many gallons of milk as he could fit in his cart. 
Now, we all know that milk is good in your refrigerator for a week and no more. Um, so what was he doing? Um, it's because the animal self, you know, we, we became in the supermarket what, what um, predators are when they fell the prey. You know, if you're a wolf grabbing hunks of meat or a lion or a tiger grabbing hunks of meat off the fallen prey, you're not thinking about the lion next to you and whether he's getting his fair share. You're just grabbing what you can get. And that animal part of, uh, of people came out and the social part, you know, disappeared. Uh, and hence, you know, you see signs up now that say one only. We had to impose some social consideration for the other fellow's need that disappeared when the animal part of people took over the supermarket basket. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think we got into our lower brainstem uh, and our primal, our primal instincts for survival. Which, I mean, they're always coming up. If you study trauma theory, your your instincts for survival and and not dying are constantly being provoked in the modern world, but in ways that aren't as clear as being chased by a bear. Uh, but I do think that the hoarding that started uh, occurring with the supermarkets and um, you know, definitely showed that people were fearing for their lives. And, and, and fear also comes obviously from not knowing what's going to happen, which we never know what's going to happen. But we, as a society, when things are functioning, it sure seems like you can predict and put stuff on your calendar. Right now, we don't know what we can put on our calendar. So I think there's, there's a heavy weight on people in quarantine, not only because of the unknown, which I was kind of emphasizing, but definitely the loneliness factor. Um, and then because you know they're not being able to see people. But then I was thinking about this. I've been reading some articles about domestic violence. So um, you know, obviously, if you're around, if you've ever been around someone on a vacation, a special someone, and you're on vacation for days and days and days and days, there's a day sometimes when there's tensions kind of rise. We get a little escalated or whatever, and then it's a, you know, we escalate the other. Uh, and if you're in close quarters with somebody that you already have a difficult relationship with, this is not good for, for certain people who depend on this living arrangement for resources and shared resources. So uh, I think, I mean, yeah, thoughts on that. Yeah, I, and, and a takeoff from it that I think is interesting. You know, if you give a billionaire a $5 bill, he could care less, right? It doesn't mean much to him. but. In the hands of a very poor person, a $5 bill is a serious thing. He can get some food, make some purchases that really matter. And in the same way, the absence of everyday interaction means something very different if you have a low order set of working connections, as opposed to if you're a billionaire of connections, you know, if you've got uh, significant others or children or neighbors or teammates or siblings or friends with whom you're very close, um, then the absence of everyday interactions is attenuated to some extent because you have non-everyday interactions. You have personal interactions and connections of importance. So the everyday kind of interactions that are gone from our lives right now, passing even a stranger on the street and saying, good morning, hi there. Or, or a friendly smile from the checkout person at the store. How you doing? Oh, nice to see you again. Uh, all those little interactions, which don't add up to much more than glitter or, or tinsel on the, on the tree of someone who's got a whole set of connections. They're delightful and pleasurable, but they're, they're on the surface and they add to the whole charm of social life. But to a lonely person, they're of critical importance. That's all they have. That's the poor man with his $5 bill, and it's gone. Now the the person who used to give him some money on the street to help him out isn't showing up anymore. So I think it's really hard for those of us who are fortunate enough to be well-connected to contemplate how much loss there is in the everyday small interactions that currently are removed from all our lives. Yes, that is that is huge. We are in a very difficult place as a world, and um, and I think it's especially. I mean, like you said, like uh, some of us are used to 
you know, work, I'm work, used to working in an office with 15 people and we're all working from home and we're chatting and texting each other and whatnot, but it's a lot different. And I'm feeling, Oh, I don't really like that. You know, my, I'm trying to make the best of it, but like everyone, but I'm thinking about somebody who is already isolated and going out and how difficult that must be for them. So, I mean, I guess a takeaway or one, an idea is if you've got the bandwidth, reach out to people in your life that you haven't talked to in a while, that might be something we can all do to try to help the burden of the suffering that's currently going on. And the weird part about the suffering is that I was thinking about this too, all this shutting inside and all these empty train stations and all these empty parks are an act of love and caring, which is such a bizarre paradox because we're, we're stopping things that make us feel good and our mental health go up so that this uh, virus spreads more slowly and thus doctors can actually treat people in a, uh, versus the hospitals being overrun and or people dying at home uh, and it's a terrible thing. So weirdly enough, this this self-imposed loneliness and quarantine or government imposed in some cases is an act of love for everyone in the world that has never come, you know, I don't know if we've ever collectively been able to understand that we're collectively loving on people yet. The side effect is that it is and can especially for people with low adaptation or low coping skills or chronic trauma or chronic loneliness be terribly detrimental to their mental health. And, and it, it is uh, May is mental health awareness month. And so I just wrote an article on our website about um, reaching out to people in your lives who struggle with mental health concerns, because one of the biggest things that most scientists agree on is when do mental health uh, symptoms show up more often stress what can cause stress? In this case, I'm seeing loneliness, not being able to do your routine, and of course, everything going along with the pandemic. So um, there's that article is on our website. Uh, you can check it out if you want, um, listeners. But yeah, so that that's kind of my thoughts on that. Uh, what, what are your thoughts? Anything further on this? Anything further on the quarantine COVID-19 discussion? Well, just um, to emphasize one point that you made, I thought was a very good point. Um, loneliness is a new creation. It didn't exist in the traditional world because our great-great-grandparents, all of us, all your listeners, you, me, great-great, triple-great, whatever it was, from there on back, they lived in small communities. They, they grew up around their siblings and around their cousins. They chose a mate from someone who was within the community. There was no social space for loneliness to take hold in. Loneliness is the creation of the modern world where we've done in the community and we live in these big societies where people are basically, you're around strangers very often during the day. In the traditional world, you were never around a stranger. That was a rare thing when a stranger showed up at the city gates, um, you know, the, the uh, European uh, uh, bard who brought stories of elsewhere. Um, and so one of the things we need to do is to recognize and struggle personally against the division that even um, seeps into our families that the high mobility of modern life has created. So many of us grow up, for example, uh, in different cities from our cousins, or we live as adults in different cities from our cousins. That In the traditional world, that, that just never happens, statistically speaking. So these are good days to call your cousins and say to yourself, I'm gonna just go right through my list of, of cousins and give them a call. They're sitting at home too, and reconnect and talk about grandma or grandpa, or do you remember that time when? So it, everything in our lives that's mechanical needs maintenance. We all know that. If you don't take that car in for maintenance, you're going to have a problem. Same with the vacuum cleaner, same with everything in your home. But it's the same with your relationships. It, we spend a lot of time not thinking about our relationships. There's studies, for example, that ask people to list out who their friends are. But then when you contact the people they've listed, it turns out a decent percentage of of those friends aren't really friends anymore. Things have moved on. 
Yes, they'll take a phone call, say hi for five minutes, but there's no warmth. There's no connection of meaning or impact anymore. So the thing to do is to main, is to concentrate on the relationships that nurture you and work on them. Think about them. Make them make them real. And this is a time when we can connect. Some of this modern technology is very useful in, in connecting. It's lovely to have a phone call with someone. That's a good start. But this idea of, of FaceTime or Zoom or something, when you can add facial expression, that brings in mirroring. That brings in the way in which body language and facial expression are such important parts of communication. So I think the final thing I would say is be active about your connections. You take your car in, you, you, take your, you make sure your vacuum cleaner bag is changed uh, timely and so on. You've got to do the same thing with your personal connections. And now is the time to do it. And I think that there are some lessons that we can all learn from COVID-19. And I think that's one of them. I think that's a wonderful send off for our listeners, Terry. And I think that's um, as much as this has made our lives difficult, let's look for a small opportunity. And I think we can all start with a phone call or reaching out to an old friend or relative. And I think that's a, a great way to foster their health as well as ours. Um, so I appreciate that insight. Well, thank you for having me on your podcast. It's been my pleasure to speak with you. Absolutely. And take care. And uh, I will be putting all of um, J.W. Freiberg's books, website, all the references in the show notes. And uh, I guess we'll be I'll be reading your books. And so I'll be uh, engaging you that way and have a great weekend. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. And send you back to bed Isolation pulled you past the tunnel to a bright world Where you can make a place to stay But everybody's scared of this place And staying away Your little house on memory lane The mayor's name is fear His force patrols the beer From a mountain of cliche That advances every day the doctor spoke a cloud, he rained out loud You'll keep your doors and windows shut And swear you'll never show a soul again But isolation pushes you till every muscle aches Down the only road it ever takes But everybody's scared of this place and staying away Your little house on memory lane If it's your decision to be open about yourself Be careful or else Be careful or else I'm comfortable apart It's all written on my chart And I take what's given me Most cooperatively Thank you all for listening. I closed with that Elliot Smith song, Memory Lane, off of his final album that came out uh, posthumously because I felt that he really captured uh, something about isolation and loneliness and how it was affecting his mental health. And I remember that album as I bought it the day it came out. Uh, This has been another episode of the Intentional Clinician Podcast. If you're enjoying it, please share it with people you know. I would surely appreciate it. Obviously, I very much appreciated having J.W. Freiberg on the show, and I would encourage you to read his books. They are really entertaining, and there's um, the learning components are weaved in there, so you don't even know that you're learning, but you will be. If you are looking for an Emdria consultant, I am now a consultant in training, and I can help you. For more details, go to Counseling Supervisor GR or healthforlifegr.com, or just send me an email. I would encourage you to join a mental health organization in your area to attempt to help increase education and also increase people's access to quality mental health care services. In Michigan, we have the Michigan Mental Health Counselors Association. Feel free to look them up in the notes. 
The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss and his guest, and while these are based upon literature and their experience in the field, they should not be viewed as the definitive opinion on any subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you are in a crisis, please dial 911 right now or the National Suicide Prevention Line at 1-800-273-8255. If you are in need of counseling, do not hesitate to make an appointment with your local counselor in your area. If you need an appointment and you are in the state of Michigan, we are still on lockdown as of this recording, and the clinicians at Health for Life Grand Rapids and the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids can see anyone over distance software who is in the state of Michigan. Uh, And we can take all insurances now, including Medicaid. So you can check us out at www.healthforlifegr.com or... 616-200-4433 616-200-4433 to find out more information about that. You can call during the regular business hours as our office staff is answering the phone from their homes. So everybody, I thank you so much for listening. Until next time, I'm wishing you all a safe and peaceful week. <laughs>